Now, in a particular way, I was actually struck by this portion of the quotes at the beginning of this pandemic, that God is opening before the church the horizons of a humanity more fully prepared for the sowing of the gospel. And this pandemic has certainly provided, um, provided a little opening for many of us in our schedules and in our, in our days. And what I'm finding is that it really has brought about a greater openness and a greater receptivity to the gospel amongst many people. People are looking for a reason to have hope, particularly in this season. And we know that the reason for that hope is the person of Jesus. I've also been really thinking a lot about these words from the letter of Paul to St. Timothy, where he says, proclaim the word and be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. But you be self-possessed in all circumstances, put up with hardship, perform the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. To be honest, these times of social distancing surely do make the work of evangelization difficult. It's not exactly convenient in this particular season to be doing the work of an evangelist because the work of evangelization is relational at the core. And we are used to being able to engage in those relationships over a dinner table or face to face. So this, um, this season of social distancing has certainly made things less than convenient. But yet we're called to persevere in the mission. The mission continues and we need to be persistent in fulfilling this mission and fulfilling this call. So what are we waiting for? In this season, people are more available and perhaps more open to the sowing of the gospel than they ever have been. So now might be the perfect time for you to begin your discovery study. For some people, the excuses and the barriers that they may have had in the past are no longer relevant in this particular season. For some people, perhaps busyness was an obstacle before. It was a reason that they hesitated to saying yes to being a part of a small group but most of us now aren't busy in the same ways that we were before. For other people, perhaps they were not wanting to make another commitment that would take them out of their homes in the evening. But if they can log on and join a discovery study from the comfort of their own homes, perhaps they'll be more willing. And it's interesting to know that I've, in a lot of the coaching and the consulting that I've been doing, I have heard from more than one person over the course of this pandemic that They've been pleasantly surprised to find out that the depth of sharing, the vulnerability, that people seem to open up even in a more quick way over Zoom. And perhaps that's because people are more comfortable. Their guard is down because they're, they're logging on from the comfort of their own home. This season of the pandemic also allows us to think outside of our own geographic confines, to think about the people that we might want to invite. We're no longer limited to inviting those who are in our close proximity. We can invite those who no longer, who don't live in our province, our neighborhood. We don't even have to be limited to our own country. I've heard of a couple of people that are now starting faith studies with people internationally as well. Leading a discovery study online is certainly not going to be the same as if you were to lead it face to face, but in this time of the pandemic, I certainly see this as a very unique opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And it's one in which those hearts are, are so open. And so it really is a unique opportunity, a unique moment that we can rise up to this challenge to proclaim the gospel using these new means of technology in a season when we cannot necessarily be face to face. As was mentioned in the introduction, I've been a missionary for 17 years and in the last few months, I have led my first ever online faith studies over Zoom. And I have to admit that I was pretty hesitant at first. I really didn't think it was going to be as good as it would be face to face. Um, and I have to admit that it is different. It is different to lead online than it is to be face to face with people. But I am seeing that it is incredibly fruitful and it works extremely well. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I want to talk about this, um, this particular webinar, I want to focus on two different aspects of getting discovery started. I want to talk about the who of discovery, and then I want to talk about the how, particularly in this new online realm. So perhaps you are already convinced, you know that you want to do this, you're ready to jump in, but you might be asking, who should I invite? 
who should be a part of my discovery study. And I want to invite you to consider this in two different ways. First off, I want to invite you to think about who in your life may be in your proximate periphery. So when we talk about the proximate periphery, we're talking about those who are close to you, but maybe far from Jesus. Who in your life maybe is close to you relationally, but is far from Jesus? It might be a friend or a neighbor or a coworker or a family member. Who in your life would benefit from hearing this message of the gospel proclaimed in a clear and simple way that would invite them to respond? For some of you as well, you might not be thinking about just starting your own personal ministry. You might have a bigger vision or a grander scale in mind. You might be thinking about how this could be impactful in renewing your parish or bringing a new life into your community. And for those of you who are thinking at that level, I really do want to invite you as well to think about who can I invite that would be ready to join me in the mission. We're going to talk a little bit about creating an impact list. I realize that that slide is incomplete. Steps to creating an effective invite list or an impact list. Um, an impact list quite simply is a list of the names of the people that you desire to build a relationship with and to seek to proclaim the gospel to. It might be in this case the list of the people that you are hoping to invite to be a part of your discovery study. As a missionary this is a, a really powerful tool that we can use to help us to remember each individual person and to pray intentionally for them and then also to strategically plan our next steps around how we would go about building that relationship and extending that invitation. So the first step of creating an effective impact list or an invite list is really prayer. I want to invite you to pray and ask the Lord. Invite the Holy Spirit to inspire your impact list. Who, Lord, do you want to be in this faith study? It ask him to give you the names of the people that he longs for, for the invitation to be extended to. And be attentive. Trust that when you ask, he will answer. And he might not give you specific names, but he might. He might give you very specific names of the people that he desires for you to reach, or he might direct you to a group of people. Perhaps he wants you to reach out to a prayer group or to the group of lectors that you're part of or to a community group. So be attentive. It might be a group at your parish. It might be co-workers. It might be neighbors. Most of the time, one of the things to be mindful of is that we need to invite, we need to invite people who we have a personal relationship with. We don't want to invite people to we don't want to invite people into a faith study if we don't really have influence in their life so having a relationship with someone um, is really effective in extending this invitation you have to have some kind of an existing relationship in order to extend that personal invitation We want to invite you to so broadly as well give everyone the opportunity to say yes I think sometimes when we are setting out to write our impact list, it's easy for us to want to say no on behalf of some people. Perhaps it's because you're afraid of rejection. You're afraid that that person would never say yes to an invitation like this. Or perhaps you think that they're too busy or that they have other commitments and they would be unwilling to take this time. And so we can easily say no for people and write them off before we even give them the opportunity to say a yes. Last week I hosted a webinar and the woman who I was co-hosting with, she entitled the event actually Created for Yes because she wanted to really hone in on this particular point that often we assume that people are going to give us a no, but in fact, every person was created for relationship with Jesus. And so really they're waiting to give their yes. They are created to say yes to this invitation. So pray, invite the Holy Spirit to inspire that impact list. And then and so broadly, I want to encourage you to write down the names of the people that you are wanting to invite. And then the last step is to actually make the invitation. And I want to encourage you when it comes to making the invitations to make it as personal as possible. 
So if you have the opportunity to see someone face to face and share a cup of coffee with them and to share with them why you think that they would be a great person to have in the faith study, that's even better than if you were to phone, phone them. Um, a phone call is better than a text and a text or an email can serve sometimes as a good icebreaker or a first step, but even after sending a text or an email, I would encourage you to make personal phone calls to follow up with each person that you want to be a part of your discovery study. For those of you who are thinking of that wider reach, let's say you're thinking about rolling this out in your parish, I want to really encourage you, particularly early on in selecting your leaders and in getting started with your, your faith studies, to be very intentional in who you invite and in who you select to be a part of your discovery studies at the beginning. The idea here is that we want to build something that's going to grow and to multiply at the parish level. And so we want to look for people who are going to be able to help us and come alongside of us as missionaries to grow and multiply this out to the parish. So in CCO, we have a simple acronym that we use here to help know who to select in leadership. And that is to look for FACT people, people who are faithful, available, contagious, and teachable. So the faithful, we want the person and the people that you're inviting to lead a faith study to have a relationship with Jesus. We want them to be actively engaged in a life of prayer and in the life of the church. We want them to be available, meaning that they're not so wrapped up in other ministries or their work commitments or their family commitments that they're unable to invest in the lives of the people that they'll be accompanying through the process. We hope to choose people who are contagious, people who model what it looks like to live in a joyful relationship with Jesus and that are attractive for other people to be around. And lastly, we want people who are teachable, that they're willing to learn and to grow in their ability to accompany others effectively using these resources and these tools. I want to encourage you um, with this quote from St. John Paul II. He says, proclaiming the word of God is not the responsibility of priests or religious alone, but it is yours too. You must have the courage to speak about Christ in your families and in the places where you study, work, or recreate. Inspired with the same fervor that the apostles had when they said, we cannot help speaking of what we have heard and seen, nor should you be silent. For there are places and circumstances where you alone can bring the seed of God's word. There are places and circumstances where you alone can bring the seed of God's word. So if you don't step into this mission, and if you aren't the one who is going to proclaim the gospel and who's going to invite people to hear this, then who will know? There are places and circumstances where you alone can bring that seed of God's word. I want to give you just a couple of moments right now, actually, to pause and we are just going to call upon the Holy Spirit right now and to ask him to place those names and those hearts upon our lives or upon our hearts, the names of the people who he desires for us to invite. So I'm going to take a couple of moments just to, to pray. And I want to invite you to grab a pen, grab a paper and be ready to hear from the Lord. Be ready for him to inspire the names of some people that perhaps you can invite. Um, or maybe it's a group of people that you want to invite, but we're just going to take a couple of moments for you to do that right now. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit. We invite you to come and to descend upon us, to inspire us, and to encourage us. Lord, we know that you have a particular mission and a particular call for each and every one of us. And Lord, we ask that you would inspire us with the names of the people who you desire for us to share this message with.
Father, we lift up each one of these people, each one of these communities that you've placed upon our hearts and we entrust them to you. Lord, you desire for them to be in relationship with you more than even we do. So Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to descend upon us, particularly as we await the coming of your Spirit to this Pentecost. Give us the courage and the boldness that we need to act on these inspirations and to courageously invite others to a deeper, more meaningful and intimate relationship with you, Jesus. We ask all of this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. So before I transition into some of the practicals of leading online, uh, do you have any questions about the invitation process or that initial component that I spoke about? Feel free to chat the, to type your questions into the chat or or, um, or even to unmute your microphone if you need to. No questions? Okay, well, if there's no questions, then I will um, continue on into the next component here. I have seven tips for you um, to take your discovery study online. So these are seven tips that I've just found to be incredibly useful and helpful in terms of the difference between leading in person versus online. Um, there are definitely like a lot more tips that I could give just about the facilitation of a small group in general, but when we specifically think about leading a discovery online, here are some top tips that I have for that particular process. Number one, make sure everyone is comfortable with the technology ahead of, ahead of time. So for some people using any sort of video conferencing technology can be super intimidating. I am a part of a women's group from my parish and I am 20 to 30 years younger than most of the other ladies that I meet with on a regular basis. And over this COVID time, we had decided that we were gonna do a Zoom meeting. And the first time that we had set up our Zoom meeting, I got a phone call about 10 minutes before things were to begin from one of the older ladies in the group. And she was asking me to walk her through it. And I did my best to try and get her all set up. We got our video working, which was miraculous. Um, but for whatever reason, I couldn't figure out how to help her with the audio. So we had her video up and we had her on speakerphone on my cell phone so she could hear and understand and it was a little bit of an ordeal. So it's really critical to ensure that everyone knows the technology ahead of time. That they know what program you'll be using and how to access it. You might even consider inviting people who feel a little bit more uncomfortable with the technology to do a trial run beforehand or giving them a phone call to help them set things up. Um, this is so important because it means that when you actually are sitting down to start your faith study, you're not going to waste 10 minutes at the beginning trying to figure out how to get everyone's video on or how to get people's audio working. The other thing that I would say here with, when it comes to technology is just to have patience and to expect in some ways the unexpected, to expect that there's gonna be some snafus along the way. People are gonna have issues with their, with their internet or with their program and we just have to be prepared for stuff to go wrong. So get comfortable with the technology. The second point that I would encourage is just ask people to find the right environment. So in this time, like seeking a time that's going to be convenient for your group is going to be really important. A lot of people, if they're working from home right now and they don't have a commute, they might have a little bit more flexibility in terms of their availability and their schedule. But you also might have to consider things like maybe they have kids at home that are going to be interrupting or making noise in the background or their spouse um, that could be interrupting things as well. So encourage your participants to choose a place in which they can be comfortable, but also a place that's going to limit the amount of distractions and background noise. It can also be really helpful just to encourage people to use headsets. 
um, that limits the background noise as well as muting your microphone when you're not speaking can be really helpful as well. The next one I would say is to encourage participants to use video. Now I know that not everyone is always comfortable turning on their video. Um, people don't always like the way they appear on screen and so sometimes they're hesitant. But as a, a facilitator, having the video on is actually incredibly helpful. It can help you to recognize body language and facial expressions. It can help you to see if people are still rapidly flipping through their Bible to find the next scripture verse that they're looking at, or if they're still thinking or writing down answers, it's easier to tell when you're able to see the screen. It can also alert you to the cues as, this, as to if someone was about to jump in to speak, um, or if they're understanding and following along well. One of the things that I found particularly helpful on Zoom is that there's a little icon there with the microphone. So you can see when someone is about to speak if they unmute their microphone. The fourth tip that I would give, um, this may or not be relevant for your particular for your particular situation, but it's just to acknowledge the elephant in the in the digital meeting room. So what I mean by that is that for people that perhaps have been used to meeting face to face, it's going to feel really awkward to be doing this online. So it's good just to acknowledge that, just to start off by saying like, you know, I really know that this is a little bit awkward. Um, it's, it's strange not being able to sit down and meet face to face, but I'm really glad that we get to continue having this meeting. Or I'm really glad that we get to start having these faith studies. And I just want to encourage you um, to participate fully, not to be afraid to jump in with your answers when you've thought of them. Starting out with something like that and just acknowledging that it is different, it's not the same, can really help people to feel a little bit more comfortable with the online platform. I also just would encourage you to, to thank people for their willingness to try something different, for their willingness to commit and show up and take part. And at the end of your very first meeting, uh, whether you do this online or you send an email or you make some phone calls or text later on, it might be helpful even just to give a few moments for people to give their feedback, just to say, how did you find that? I know it's different than meeting in person, but do you have any tips for how you might recommend improving it? Or do you, how did you find the, the experience of being online? The fifth point I would say is to take time to build relationships. And I really encourage you to take 10 minutes at the beginning of every one of your small groups that you lead online, just to connect, to chat with people, to delight in them, to really catch up. We would do this really naturally if we were to meet face to face, right? As people show up, you're checking in on how their week was, you're talking about what's going on in their life, you're pouring them a cup of coffee. It naturally happens that we take time to build relationships when we meet face to face. But when we go digital, it's easy for us to lose this. And part of the reason for that is that it does feel a little bit less natural when we are meeting online. And so there's a tendency sometimes to just want to dive right into the business component and not to be attentive to the soul that's right in front of you. So this, this time of relationship building in your first lesson might just include some time for um, introductions, inviting people to share who they are and why they've decided to take part in the faith study. It's really important here as well to remember that the goal of the discovery faith study is not so much about the content and the presentation of the material, but it really is a tool that is here to help you accompany others on their journey of discipleship. So the goal is the people. The goal is the accompaniment of people. The people are what's most important, not the program. And this is why establishing this foundation of trust and relationship building is so critical. It's so important. I think it's also important to recognize that these are really challenging times for people. People are facing new fears and challenges that they maybe didn't see coming or they didn't know and you know, every day is different. Some days you might feel like things are going really well and other days you might just have a really hard day at home with those kids or whatever it might be. So it's important just to give people some time to talk about these challenges, to talk about the fears 
to acknowledge those things so that we can leave space to talk about the things that really matter. My sixth point is as much as possible, try to treat this like a regular group, like you would any small group that you were meeting, even if you were able to meet in a face-to-face -face context. So I always recommend, try to imagine that you are seated around a table instead of just staring at your screen. Try to imagine what it would be like if you were all sitting around at the table, sharing a cup of coffee and having a conversation. I always recommend setting a group size of about four to six participants. It can be difficult when there's more than that, um, particularly on the online platform, to ensure that everyone is engaged. I always encourage people with Discovery to bring their own Bible, encourage them to have a pen and a notebook so that they can take some notes as we go through the faith study as well. Don't forget to do an opening and a closing prayer. Take some time to do that. Um, this is also a great opportunity, especially at the end, for people to voice what their petitions are, to voice what they'd like prayer for. Don't be afraid as well to call people by name. Sometimes people on the online forum are a little bit more hesitant to join into the conversation. They're a little bit more hesitant to speak. And I find that this is partly because they're afraid of speaking over someone else. They're not too sure who's going to jump in first. And so they have a tendency to be a little bit reluctant. So sometimes having the ability to call someone by name and just get the conversation started can be really helpful. If I were leading a small group around a table, I would kind of assign an order to the reading and the, the scripture reading or the reading of the text within the scripture, within the Bible, the faith study itself, pardon me. Um, I would ask the person to my left to read the first scripture and then the next person to read the next verse, etc. And I found that on Zoom in a particular way, when you have the gap gallery view, you have an order that it's very easy to kind of follow a similar order as I would if I were meeting in face to face to ask one person um, at my top left of my screen and just kind of work my way across. So as a facilitator, another important point, point here, just as you would if you were leading this group in person, take time, take time to prepare, to read the lesson ahead of time, to review the lesson, to prepare prepare each lesson. Um, take note if there are particular questions that you really hope to get everyone weighing in on, questions that you want to hear a response from everyone. So as an example, in discovery lesson one, in question number four, there's actually, a, it's not even the main question, but it's a sub question in the leader's notes that asks, the, asks about, invites people to share about a personal experience that they've had of God's love. And this is one that I love to to take time with. I really enjoy getting to hear and it so gives a, a really great insight into where people are starting from on their journey as you invite them to share their personal experience of God's love. But yet there's a lot of other questions in Discovery Lesson 1 and throughout the Discovery that are far more direct and straightforward and you don't have to have every person weigh in on those conversations. I also have found in the digital format it's really important to give even more verbal feedback to participants. Um, so after someone shares, I'll often jump on and just say, you know, thanks for sharing that, that was a great point. Um, and just giving even more encouragement verbally than I normally would. Partly that's because if you were meeting face to face, you could really show your participants that you're attentive to what they're sharing by your body language, by making sure that they know that you're looking at them, that you're being attentive to what they're sharing. But when you're staring at a screen, it's hard, it's to give that same kind of intentionality to and attentiveness to them. So the verbal feedback is one way in the digital means that I found to be even more important than when you're meeting face to face. The other thing that I would encourage is if there are questions where you were hoping to hear more responses and maybe you've had two or three people that have been quiet throughout, don't be afraid at the end of a question to say like, you know, Sally, Sarah, Jane, we haven't heard heard from you, um, do you have anything to add? So again, calling people by name, um, even if it's not singling people out, but calling on a few people can be really helpful. The last thing that I would highlight here in terms of uh, treating this like a regular group 
is that right now online you can access all of the faith studies and in the discovery leaders portion you also have the ability to access training videos for each lesson so this is a really great asset to help you navigate the details of each lesson so you can log on with your leader's guide and with these training videos, it will be a great asset to help you prepare for leading well. My final point um, is don't fear the silence. And again, I find like this can be a really big one, particularly in the online format. People are more uncomfortable over a video call. And I find that there's naturally longer pauses and more silent time between when you ask a question and when people begin to respond on the online format. I think partly that could be because people are hesitant. They are waiting to see if someone else is going to jump in to respond first. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to just lean into that quiet time and to pray, to use that quiet time to, in those 15 seconds between when you ask a question and when you start to hear answers, to give that time just to really pray that the Holy Spirit would be stirring in the hearts of your participants. Use that time to really invite the Holy Spirit to be present. I find also in every small group, you have a tendency to have that one person who does the lion's share of the talking. And often in small groups there's also that person that's a little bit more reserved so you have to think about how you will manage that in the face of an online group it might mean specifically inviting other people to share before that talker gets in there first um, or it might mean with that more reserved person again calling them by name and inviting them to share in one of the last discovery studies that i i led i had exactly that situation happen i had that person who was like super super talkative and i had a couple of people who were much more reserved and i had asked one particular question and the talkative lady got going and she just talked and talked and talked and she actually ended up like not just answering the question but kind of getting off topic so as quickly as i could without being super rude i interrupted her um, and I, I thanked her for sharing i reminded people what we were meant to be talking about about because I didn't want the next person to kind of continue on the tangent that she had left off on. Reminded them what we were talking about and then invited others to join in the conversation. In that same study, I had a few much more quiet participants who, you know, over half of the lesson had gone by and I don't think I'd heard a word out of either of them. And so towards the end of that um, study, uh, I asked one of the questions and I actually specifically called those two quiet quieter people by name. I said, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you have anything you'd like to share on this particular question? So it's really important just to learn how to navigate those situations. Um, it's a skill that every small group facilitator needs to have. And in a particular way, when you're facilitating online, it takes a new, a new role um, and a new ability to navigate those things. So once again, just to recap it all, seven tips for taking your discovery online. Number one is to get comfortable with the technology. Number two, to make sure that people are in the right environment that's going to be limited background noise, limited distraction. Number three, to encourage the participants to use video. This is going to be really helpful for you as a facilitator to be able to see what's happening as they're interacting with the content. Number four, to acknowledge the elephant in the digital meeting room, letting people know that this isn't the same as meeting face to face but in this particular season, this could be a real blessing. Number five, don't forget to take time at the beginning of each one of your lessons to build relationships, to delight in people, and to remember that it is about accompanying people through this process more than it is about the specific content of each lesson. Number six, as much as possible, treat this like any regular group. Um, imagine that you were meeting face-to-face -face and treat this as much as you can and like a regular group. And last but not least, don't be afraid of the silence. Give some space for that to happen and count on there being a little bit more silence in an online version than there might even be if you were to be meeting face to face. So those are my seven tips for taking discovery online. 
Um, I want to open it up again. If there are questions for, from the audience, feel free to include those in the chat or to unmute yourself and to share. One thing that maybe I will just quickly share with you is we've talked a little bit about the online platform where all of the videos are available and the resources themselves are available. So when you go to CCO's Thinkific platform, you'll find that there's a number of different things that you can register for. But the Discovery Leaders Guide is one of them, the Discovery Leaders course. It's free for you to register. When you click on that, you're going to be brought into here obviously I've started the the lesson before so I'll hit resume course and when you get into there you are going to see at the top part what you'll find is actually the discovery leaders guide itself so you'll see here's lesson two um, you'll find that within this context there is the leaders prep notes um, and the full lesson is here for you to review but if you scroll down, you'll also find that there are videos. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a video for each lesson. So here's lesson one's video. Um, it will load um, and it's a simple video that will help to walk you through how to lead lesson one effectively. So I really encourage you if you are going to lead a discovery or you're thinking about it even, log into this just to take a look, watch some of the videos and get a feel for what it's all about. Any questions about getting started with discovery in general or starting discovery online? Great question. How do you sign up to take a course? Um, it's pretty simple. You're going to go to the platform and you, you can register um, for a number of different courses. So that would include the discovery study, but you can also look at any of our other um, any of our other courses as well. So I'm just going to copy in the chat here um, the link to where you can find that. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory. You just go there and you can sign up for any one of those courses. Um, I actually kind of um, probed Francesca to share. We were just met today with a group of key uh, leaders in our ministry and um, some are going to launch faith studies this semester and I mean the summer right now and I just uh, we we're just looking to see where people were at with it and who was going to start and if people had had names and um, I was just really blown away when Francesca shared so I just Francesca would like to invite you to share. Yeah, thanks, Tal. <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, Amber, thank you so much for um, that's it being available to to all of us and to to host these uh, webinars. Like, I, I think it's really great that uh, we get more tools to be able to to evangelize, and we know that it's not always easy, and we tend to overthink. But really, it's it's really simple, just by creating and building relationships, right? So, uh, yeah, what Tal was saying about um, that's it because we were talking about like my my impact list and all that, and then I was thinking of all those. Friends who have drifted away from from church like uh, I grew up with a lot of friends uh, being uh, in the altar server ministry at my parish and then they all just kind of drifted away and then I ended up actually with a list of uh, 20 people and then I actually I added like five more people to my list just today um, after my conversation with Tal so I'm like you know what, <laughs> let me just reach out to, to all of these people. And I actually, because I was so pumped and I was so motivated, I actually started just sending out text messages being like, hey, um, do you have time to talk? You know, we haven't talked in a while. I just wanted to see what you're up to. And I also wanted to ask you something. And then I would wait until the person would respond to me. And then I would, you know, give them a phone call. And actually I got three people on board 
uh, just today, just from, you know, a simple, <laughs> a simple fight. Actually, I thought that the conversation would take like five minutes, but then you end up, you know, just uh, catching up on, on people's lives and all that. So it's just really beautiful. And yeah, if ever you're afraid, you know, of, of reaching out, don't be afraid. And uh, yeah, God is really working through people and the Holy Spirit really does wonders. And uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to also bring this to my parish as well. Wonderful. That's amazing. If you've never done a faith study, does it matter? And how can you get support? Great question. So um, I think ideally we would love to see people have the opportunity to go through discovery as a participant before they lead a faith study. But we also recognize that that's not necessarily always the case, that that can be possible. You might be in a parish where it's not accessible for you to have someone else lead the faith study for you. Uh, so there are opportunities for you to just take up the cross and, and lead it yourself, you know, to, to take that step and to, to learn it as you go, but to lead it yourself. Um, there may be some opportunities as well uh, within the diocese um, through Terrell and Corey and, um, and maybe through some of the student leaders or leaders um, that there is a possibility that there could be some groups organized, particularly for those who are interested in leading that haven't had that experience. Um, but I'll leave that up to them to kind of communicate a little bit more. But I have to say that actually the platform that I just showed you gives you a lot of support. The leader's guide is fairly idiot proof, I have to say. It is, um, it is very well set up. It gives you the answers that you need. It gives you more information than what you're going to need to have these conversations. And then the training videos that help you to walk through the leader's guide if you watch those training videos and you read through the discovery study and you have a relationship with Jesus, I think that you have more than what it takes to be able to start a small group. So don't be afraid to give it a try. I don't know, Terrell or Corey, do you want to speak to any of the diocesan kind of plans or support that maybe would be available? within Montreal? Uh, sure, well, this initiative is new, but definitely um, uh, we'd be happy to help facilitate uh, people who want to learn how to lead but are uncomfortable just jumping into it. Um, so whoever is interested in uh, getting started but is not comfortable just jumping into it right away definitely reach out to Corey and I and we'll be in touch with Amber and we'll try to organize um something yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to help facilitate that uh it uh but I wouldn't be afraid to to just try uh, I, that was yeah. my experience when we were starting faith studies from scratch at McGill uh, one of my students just introduced it. I, I, I shared the same testimonial last week. But one of my students is like, I'm super excited. I'm here from Queens. We have this thing called Face Studies. And then I read Discovery over Christmas. And I'm like, we should be doing this already. So I'm like, how do we do it? And like, oh, we'll just get you and a couple other people to volunteer to be leaders. I find out a year later that most of the time people do Discovery before they lead Discovery. But sure. I suppose we didn't have that option. So... Uh, when you have motivated people and the Holy Spirit's blowing through, um, I wouldn't let something like I haven't done discovery before be an obstacle to no. just doing it. But absolutely, if you'd like to go through a more uh, traditional process, we can try to facilitate that. I can't think off the top of my head exactly how we'll do that, but let just come forward and we'll take it from there. Yeah, I have to say, like, in the work that I'm doing and consulting and coaching parishes all over North America, uh, we have seen both happen, right? Sometimes we have uh, CCO alumni who have been a part of faith cities on their campus, and they're bringing it into the parish. Sometimes we have people who are in a place where they don't have CCO and they've just heard about it and they're excited about it and they're like, let's try it. And they just run with it. And we see just as much fruit in those places as we do when it's somebody who has a lot of experience starting it. So 
really just trust that the, the content itself, the materials itself, really will give you the support that you need. And just follow the Holy Spirit's lead. You know, one of our, our um, I mentioned I co-hosted a webinar last week with a woman from Calgary, actually. And this woman had seen her children actually experience conversion through CCO on their campus. And they were so inspired by the changes that they saw in their, in their children that they decided they needed to do something like this at their parish. So her and her husband started forming a team of people that were going to get involved in this ministry. None of them had ever taken discovery before, but they just started leading it for other people at their parish. And within this last year, they have seen some remarkable things happen. Um, they have so many people that are going through the faith studies and it all started because they were just inspired by the Holy Spirit to take that step. Nobody had taken discovery before. Any other questions? There was a question from Corey on the alias iPhone. <laughs> so Proclaim is a movement um, here in the Vancouver Diocese. It was a movement that was started um, in October of this last year in the extraordinary month for the mission as declared by Pope Francis. And this was a movement that was launched here to activate missionary disciples within the archdiocese. So people here within our archdiocese, um, the idea is to awaken disciples to begin to proclaim the name of Jesus. And so we are relying quite heavily on both Alpha and the Discovery Faith Study. And we are empowering and encouraging people to take the initiative to proclaim the gospel. It's a beautiful movement that's not dependent or not dependent upon or tied to your parish or your parish communities necessarily. It's not waiting for your pastor to buy in and to make sure that everything is um, under his authority, but it really is just awakening us in our baptismal call, our baptismal identity to step out and to begin the work of proclaiming the gospel. Hi, Amber. Hi, Lisa. Um, how's it going? Great. <laughs> um, I just, I really am interested, okay, but I'm very stuck on this. I haven't taken the course yeah. and I don't know where to begin kind of thing. And yeah. I think it's a wonderful, um, for, like, I think it could be something wonderful to bring to my parish. I just fear taking it on when I haven't actually participated do you understand yeah, totally so is I, that i just need to like i understand i can start it without knowing what i'm doing okay sure. I've, I've done that a lot of times i had kids <laughs> hey you know they, they worked out really well <laughs> um but i think that like anything that you're starting in the parish i think it's so important to come prepared and that's my fear. My fear is if I start this and I don't know what I'm doing because I haven't gone through it, that it won't be fruitful. And that is what I want, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, can I actually take the course online or I need to be part of, like, like I don't, that's what I wasn't understanding. Oh, sure, sure. sure. So with that platform that I posted. Right you can register to see all of the resources. So it's not gonna give you a small group experience of like taking the faith study, but it does give you the opportunity to review it all and to read through all of the material. But if what you're looking for is more of like the experience of like, hey, I'd love to take this in a small group before I step out to lead it for others, that's where I would, I would kind of say like, Terrell, Corey, like what can we do? Um, is there a group? Um, that we could maybe pull together a small group of leaders like yourself, Lisa, who are interested in seeing how this all works so that they can roll it out to the parish. Um, I had the opportunity, as I mentioned, to lead Discovery online during this uh, pandemic, and it was particularly for a ministry 
that much like you, they're like, they, they, they thought this would be really helpful and really useful for their organization, but nobody had taken it before. So they, they wanted to kind of have their leaders get the experience of going through it before they stepped out to lead it. So I actually ended up leading that Faith City Online for them over six weeks. Um, so perhaps something like that would be possible um, with a small group of people, even within your own archdiocese, if there are, if there are a few people that are, um, that are interested in kind of learning more. So um, Terrell and Corey, I'm sure are hearing you loud and clear that, <laughs> that there is interest. So hopefully we can, um, they can arrange that. Um, I know as well that there are some, um, some people like Francesca, uh, um, and there's some that I think are going to be leading in their parishes over the summer. I'm not sure where those parishes are, but maybe Tal can speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah, we have um, uh, we have a couple of students that are hoping to launch them in their parishes. So it's just like very much at the beginning stage. And um, I just have to look a bit at my the next um, few weeks and my next couple of months. But if possible, like I'd be happy to lead um, a small group through um, in preparation for the fall or in preparation, um, yeah, just to, to go through it. And, and it's a gift as well for the leader. Like I've led, Amber and I have led Discover, I don't know how many times, we led it as university students. And then I was one of those students, there was no, uh, we had nothing Catholic on our campus. We started a Catholic club and then I heard about CCO and I got the faith study and I never actually went through it. But, um, but like I've led it, we've all led it many times but every time it's new and every time, because it's the gospel message. And so we need to hear it again. And, um, and then hearing it, like hearing those in the study discover it as well, then you're like, yeah, it's always, always new. So it's always a gift. So um, either that, or I'd be happy to help Terrell or Corey lead one um, from them or just, yeah, find a way, but um, yeah. Yeah, oh, awesome. Yeah. And you said it was six weeks? It's six so weeks, yeah. It's an app. Pardon? Yeah, what, com what comes after discovery? So there is a, a whole series of faith studies that are available through CCO. Discovery is step one, which is the basic presentation of the gospel and invitation to relationship with Jesus. It's six weeks long. The second book in the series is called Source, and it focuses on developing a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the third in the series is called Growth. And it starts to look at different elements that we need to grow as disciples. So prayer, scripture, sacraments, witness, fellowship, service. The fourth in the series is called trust. And it starts to look at areas of our life that we need to go deeper in trusting the Lord and in trusting his, his Lordship in our life. And then the fifth and final one in the series is called commission. And it is quite different than the others, but this one focuses in on our baptismal call to the mission. And it helps people to identify what their particular role in evangelization and in the mission of the church might be. So all set, the first three are six weeks long each. Um, and then um, it's eight and nine, I think, or the last two are eight and nine weeks long. So all said and done, it's just over 30 some weeks of content. Um, so some parishes, uh, they, some parishes take an approach where they invite people to do a discipleship year and they actually get through all of that content in a year, which I find is really a lot <laughs> to do in a year. Other parishes, they offer, you know, one or two faith studies in a year. So in the course of two or three years, somebody would get through the whole process. So it really just depends upon the people and the parish, the pace at which they want to, to move. So what it could look like is you begin with a discovery course. You can run a discovery course multiple times in a year. Yeah. And then like say the second year, you, maybe you can start incorporating a second along the, which would you say was uh, after discovery is what? Source. 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 So you can start, you can incorporate a discovery, um, a source into the discovery, like, you know, do you know what I'm like, you know, like, yeah. and then so you can what, alternate. One of, the, one of the things, like, yeah, as you start to think about, like, a rhythm and planning it all out, one of the things that I always encourage is to try to keep the gap between when a participant takes discovery and source as narrow as possible, because that's where we find we have the biggest attrition is after discovery, um, if people go right into source or they start source fairly quickly, they'll be very likely after source to be excited about taking the next one and the next one. 
But if there's a big gap between discovery and source, sometimes that's where we see we lose people. So we always encourage people to try to keep that gap as narrow as possible. Okay. But we have parishes, yeah, that are doing so many different things. So we have parishes that they have an intake for discovery once a year, and then the other upper level faith studies are running throughout the year. We have other parishes where they have um, they have kind of three faith study slots throughout the year. And at this particular point in time, there's a parish in Vancouver who is now in their 18th round of faith studies. So they've been running discovery and faith studies for so long. I showed the video last week from Father Justin actually. Um, and so they have in every, any round, they would have all five faith studies happening simultaneously. Like you could be in whatever level you are currently at. So lots of different ways of approaching it. Um, the one thing that I would just say is as you're starting out, it's like don't be afraid to start small because we really are wanting to see things multiply and multiplication takes time, um, but it also takes a concentrated effort. So if you're really considering this for the parish level, you're, you're thinking about how this could kind of go on to that level, be really intentional in the beginning of, as I mentioned about leadership selection, really trying to be selective of who's in your first small groups. Um, bring other people with a missionary mindset alongside of you so that you can begin to grow and multiply um, and take your time at the beginning. Don't rush into it. Don't overstretch yourselves. Thanks. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Great. Just, mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, we seem to have uh, used our a lot of time for this evening. Uh, so to respect everyone's time, we're going to call it uh, quits in a few moments. I was just reminded by um, the alias uh, iPhone, Corey Jolly, uh, to mention another webinar that we're planning in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, that parish that uh, Amber's been referring to uh, in Vancouver, one of them that's uh, really into doing uh, faith studies, uh, St. Anthony of Padua. Their pastor, Foster, Father Justin Huang, is going to be doing a webinar with us, and it's going to be on, uh, um, the title is called, Did the Mission Ever Change? Uh, the Experience of a Pastor Before, During, and After the Pandemic. So Father Justin really wants to have an opportunity to share his story, especially with other pastors, but also with uh, any of the faithful who are interested in enjoying to, to hear more about his journey of uh, parish renewal uh, over at St. Anthony of Padua's and his whole perspective on mission. And when we were talking about having this webinar, he was talking a lot about how it's, it's true that we have to adapt to make changes now because of the pandemic and social distancing. But the truth is the mission didn't change. It's the same mission. and We needed to adapt before and we need to adapt now. And we'll need to adapt again in the future. And we just need to continue to be innovative and in finding ways of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to people so they can have a transformative encounter with him and an opportunity to, uh, um, as we say in, in CCO, uh, put, put our relationship with Christ at the center of our lives. Uh, so that's coming up on June 10th. And I just saw in the notes, if you're interested in getting in touch with Amber, I believe she just posted in the chat her email address. So, yeah. so if you have any questions about getting things started or you want to take the next step, feel free to reach out to me. I do this all the time, so <laughs> I'm an expert at, at getting things started. So I would, yeah, be helpful, happy to help in any way that I can. Good, and and Lisa and any others who are interested in experiencing a faith study, uh, we can continue that conversation. Tal already has said she might be willing to help with a group, uh, and we could uh, look around to find others to help with, um, maybe leading another discovery and uh, we could definitely help to facilitate that. And uh, for the rest of you, thank you so much for participating. Tell your friends about us. I, I've been uploading these recordings on the YouTube. So if you go to the Pillars Trust YouTube channel, I emailed all, the part, all of you participants last week. So tomorrow morning, I'm gonna upload the video again 
And if you wanted to share this webinar tonight and last week's webinar with other people who you think would be interested in learning more about CCO and about faith studies and about evangelizing online, definitely feel free to check out those resources and consider subscribing because uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel helps to raise our profile so that our content is easier to be reached by more and more humans uh, out on the interwebs. So uh, without further ado, thank you again so much, Amber and Tal and Corey in the background and everybody else who participated. And I hope you all have a very pleasant evening. Ta-ta. Bye.